you hope for? Anything in particular? Uh, do you hope you'll have a nice day? Do you hope it doesn't rain? Uh, do you hope you'll make your appointment for lunch on time? Do you hope everything will work out? Do you hope this sermon will be short? <laughs> Good luck with that. We tend to speak of hope as wishful thinking or as having a sort of positive attitude about things. But what is true Christian hope? Is it wishful thinking? Is it just having a positive attitude? Well, today we're going to look at Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 through 8. And we're going to read what the Apostle Paul says that true Christian hope is and how we may have it. I'm going to begin by reading Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, and then we will come back and take a look at each verse more closely. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Paul begins, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out upon us in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's go back and look more closely at what Paul says here. Chapter 5, verse 1, he begins with, therefore. Now, what do you mean, therefore? Well, it's based on what Paul has said previously about Christians receiving justification and a right relationship with God through faith and by faith alone. So, therefore, since we, notice how he includes the Christians at Rome as well as himself, we have been justified. Now, you catch that? Have been. Not going to be. We have been. It's, it's a done deal. It's already happened. We have been justified. What do you mean justified? Diakothentes in the Greek. Rendered just. Rendered innocent. Acquitted. We have been justified through faith. Mediated by faith. Whose faith? We should know that by now. The faith of Jesus. We have been justified through the faith of Jesus. We have peace. That's a fact. That's not we wish we had peace, or it would be nice if we had peace, or maybe someday we're going to have peace. Paul says we have peace. The promises, the gifts of God, the privileges are assured. We have peace with God. Now, when we think of the word peace in the Greek, irene, when we think of peace, what do we think of? Oh, I'm, I'm at peace. I'm relaxed. I'm comfortable. Or we may think, thank God, at least I'm not at war. We're at peace. But Paul uses the Greek word in a different kind of a sense. It's not a sense of feeling, of well-being, but it 
It's a present reconciled status. As we read it in the Greek Old Testament, it has to do with being in a right covenant relationship with God. So that's what he's saying is we have peace. We have a right covenant relationship with God. And how did we do that? It was mediated to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He made us right. He made us at peace with God. And as he says, through, mediated by, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have it any other way. You cannot have peace with God any other way except through Jesus Christ. Now, some may say, well, what about those who don't know Jesus? Well, I trust in the Lord. Someday they're going to find out how that's going to happen. I don't fully know. I just know and trust and believe that it will. But I also know that the peace with God is only through, mediated by Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through whom, in other words, mediated by, through whom we have gained access. Now that's an interesting word, access. Access to the divine presence. Now what's interesting about the word is that it's the same Greek word used in the Greek Old Testament for the ceremonies of the Day of Atonement. Do you remember how on the Day of Atonement, once a year, only the high priest and the high priest alone could enter into the Holy of Holies, into the, the throne of God before the ark? Only the high priest could come into the presence of the throne room of God. And the ceremonies by which he got there were all called the ceremonies of access. So we get it here. Access through the ceremonies and rituals that lead you into the presence of God. In, under the old covenant, only the high priest once a year. Under the new covenant, everyone. How? Through our high priest, Jesus Christ, mediated that access to us. Gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And one of the interesting things about the Apostle Paul that sometimes makes him difficult to understand is he can use the same word in different contexts with different meanings. So you can't say, well, Paul used this word here and meant that, but you better look at the context over here. If Paul uses the same word, he may have another spin on it, he may have another nuance. And here with grace, I would suggest that grace is God's favor, and it's unmerited. But here he's speaking of grace as a state or a realm. Notice that we've entered into a realm. We've entered into a state of grace, unmerited pardon and forgiveness, love of God by faith, the faith of Jesus primarily. We have entered into that state into that realm of grace in which we now stand. Stand confidently, boldly, taking one's life before God, entering boldly before the throne of grace. We have confidence to stand like that. And we boast. Now the word boast is interesting. Sometimes in the NIV here it's translated glory, Sometimes it's translated boast. What does it mean? It means to exalt, to exalt proudly, to exalt joyfully. And so we boast in the hope. Ah, there's that word. In the hope. The confident realization of the future now in our present experience. I'm going to talk more about hope, but let's kind of understand that. That hope is something we have now based on the future that we believe is absolute, certain, and sure. And because we believe that and know that in our present state, we have hope. We boast in the hope. And what is our hope? In the glory of God in the manifestation here of God, in the presence of God, going boldly before his throne to the glory of God, 
being like the resurrected Jesus Christ in glory. We boast in the hope of glory. Sometimes we talk about, well, I'm going on to glory. And yes, you are going on to glory. And we boast in that hope that we have. Verse 3, not only so, but we also now, they changed the same word, boast, glory. But we also glory, boast, exalt proudly and joyfully. We boast and glory in our sufferings. Same word translated, tribulations, persecutions. And it's talking about what you suffer being a follower of Jesus. What you suffer for being a Christian. We glory in our sufferings. Now Paul's a realist. Did you notice that? He says, oh, we have the hope of glory. Yay, glory. Someday, glory. Ah, today's not so good. Yeah, today is rough. It doesn't seem like someday we're going to be in glory because right now, ah, life can be challenging. But he says this, but here's what hope does for you. We glory in our sufferings, our tribulations, knowing that tribulation, trial, suffering produces, accomplishes perseverance. Better translation, endurance. Suffering produces endurance, steadfastness, fortitude. And perseverance, endurance, Tested and proven character. That's what you come out of a trial with. Proven and tested character. And character brings hope. The confident expectation of hope. Verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame, disgrace, because, here's why, a hody clause, as they say in the Greek, because, for the purpose of, here's, how this works out. Because God's love, uh, more than human love, God's love, God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Poured out. That's that Greco-Roman philosophical thing of something that's lavish. When something is abundant and lavish, it's poured out. So the love of God has been poured out lavishly and abundantly into our hearts, into our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings through, mediated by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What does that mean? It means all of it's a gift. Faith, hope, love, it's a gift from God in which we may participate, is our response. Okay, he begins verse 6 with one of our favorite words, church. Gar, which we all know means for. In other words, here comes my explanation now. For, to explain what I've just said in verses 6 through 8. For, you see, at just the right time. What do you mean at just the right time? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I hope the Roman Christians do, because I'm not sure I do. Exactly. What does Paul mean by at just the right time? Does he mean at just the right time in history? You know, some theologians have said Jesus came when he did because it took a whole preparatory phase of the old covenant with sacrifices, shedding of blood, death, to pay the penalty for sins, and all of the what we might call ceremonial aspects of the old covenant and the temple and everything for humans to kind of grasp this concept of Jesus, Savior, High Priest, atonement, sacrifice for sin. That humans would not have comprehended Jesus until a certain point in history that they had been prepared to do so. Is that what he means? Perhaps. Does he mean at just the right time? like before the foundation of the world, like the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Was that the right time? Or does he mean in the right time or the, the right season of your life, of the individual, that where you recognize Jesus died for you? 
or does Paul mean all of the above? Take your pick. But one thing we know, it was at the right time. You see, just at the right time, the right appropriate season, when we humans, Jews, Gentiles, all of us, we humans were still powerless, without strength, weak, helpless. Adam sinned. We're doomed. Helpless, weak, without strength. Well, we were still powerless in our sins. Christ died for the ungodly. Oh my, can you put your mind around that? Christ died for. Hooper in the Greek, it means representatively. On behalf of, as a representative of. Christ died for the Christians. No, that's not what it says. Christ died for the ungodly, and that's a strong pejorative term. Christ died for the wicked. You mean Jesus died for serial killers? Yeah. Did he die for wicked despots and tyrants, terrorists? Yeah. Can we get our minds around that? That God so loved the world, everyone. Jesus died for everyone. Now, I know some don't believe that, but I think the scriptures are pretty clear. Jesus died for the ungodly, for the wicked. And Paul kind of emphasizes it this way in verse 7. Very rarely, ordinarily not, Will anyone die for a righteous person? Dakaiu, a righteous person. What does that mean? Well, basically, innocent, equitable, just, decent person. Person on the street, neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. Would you die for them? Very rarely. Though for a good person, and the Greek here seems to mean a benefactor, someone who does good for you, we might say a family member. a really good friend who's done good for you and you've done good for them and there's an exchange going on. Though for a good person, family member, spouse, child, parent, someone might perhaps possibly dare to die. Perhaps. But God demonstrates his own love in contrast to the very best of human love. Fatherly love, motherly love, the love of parent for child, the love of child for parent, brother for brother, brother for sister, sister to sisters. The very best of human love, nothing compared to the love of God. But God demonstrates his own love for us, Paul says, for us in this while we, we, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. You know, I've heard some churches say things like, well, you repent of your sins and get your life straightened out. And when you're fully obedient, then we'll baptize you and Jesus will forgive your sins. What? Good luck with that. Christ already died for you while you were yet sinners. For you did anything. Jesus died for you. Christ died for us. Christ's death meant life for you and me. So what do we learn? What is true Christian hope? Hear me, church. It is a perception of the present based on the promise of God's presence, power, and love. It actually has more to do with the present than it does for the future. So I hope for the future. Well, that hope is good right now. That's what that hope is for, right now. Hope is that which enables us to move confidently and joyfully toward the future. 
because of the reality and the evidence of experiencing God's presence, power, and most of all, his love now in our lives. Okay, you may ask the question, how do we have hope and how do we get it? Okay, hope comes from a subjective realization mediated by the Holy Spirit of the objective fact of God's love for us. Experiencing God's love brings us hope that is strong and unbreakable, unshakable. Okay, then you ask, how do I know God loves me? How do I know God loves me? Well, Scripture tells us that God so loved the world, the cosmos, everybody, even sinners, God so loved the world that he gave his unique son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Jesus' faithful death is the ultimate expression of God's love for us. Get that? Jesus' faithful death is the ultimate expression of God's love for us. It's the evidence. Now, our hope is not based on wishful thinking. It is based on evidence. And the faithful death of Jesus is evidence of how far God is willing to go and his abundant and absolute love for us. As theologian Thomas Torres strikingly put it, quote, with the cross, we see that God loves us more than he loves himself. I have to take a step back and think about that for a while. Can you get your minds around that and ponder that? That the death of Jesus shows that God loves us more than he loves himself? Whoa. So how do we experience the love of God that gives us such hope? Well, God the Father, through Jesus Christ, mediated by the Holy Spirit, pours out his love on us so that we can subjectively experience it. As Paul explained, the Holy Spirit mediates the love of God to us, and it is through the Holy Spirit that we realize and experience how much God loves us. You wouldn't know that if the Holy Spirit hadn't revealed it to you. If the Holy Spirit hadn't touched your mind and heart, you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't believe that. It is mediated through the Holy Spirit indwelling us. The Holy Spirit is the holy presence of God and through whose, through whose communion we may know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father. How many times have we closed our church service with those words, that benediction from the end of the book of 2 Corinthians from the Apostle Paul? about, and may you know the love, the grace, may you know the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Farewell and amen. Think about what it means, though. The Holy Spirit. We may know God's presence and God's love through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, and the love of God the Father, how? in the communion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actualizes subjectively what has been accomplished for us objectively in the life and death and life of Jesus. Thus, both love and hope are gifts from the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. Now, at this point, you may say, okay, Pastor Dad, I've heard all those words you've been mumbling. <laughs> What does it mean? What am I supposed to say? If you get nothing else out of it, here's the point. God loves you. Bottom line, God loves you and you know it. You know it. You feel it. You believe it. 
you live by it, and you have hope. In it. Now, I mentioned that experiencing God's love brings hope that is strong and unshakable. How does that work? All right. Realizing we are beloved of God, we know that when we suffer tribulation, persecution as Christians, God is always with us and for us in it and sees us through it. Now, knowing that, then tribulation, just what does it do? Well, it produces endurance. I know God's with me. I know God's for me. I know God loves me. Yeah, it's bad right now, but God loves me, and he's here with me. He's not leaving. I'm in the lion's den, but you know what? God's with me. I'm in a ship battered by the wind and the waves, but you know what? God is with me. So what's this tribulation producing? Endurance. Hang on. Hang on and see how God works this out. So it produces endurance. And endurance produces tested and tried character. And character produces hope that is strong and unshakable. It's a process of hope unto hope. So, knowing how much God loves us, knowing what God is doing for us now and is going to be doing for us throughout all eternity, knowing that God so loved us that he gave his unique son, Jesus, so that we would not perish but have eternal life, knowing what God has done, is doing, and will do for us throughout eternity, knowing that, we have hope. Hope that's not just wishful thinking. Hope that's not just having a positive attitude, but hope that has its foundation, its evidence, and its reality in who God is and in God himself. Who God is. No matter what we may face in the present world, whether it be tribulation, severe trial, persecution, illness, even death, by the grace and love of God, we have hope that does not fail. We have the hope of an incredible and wonderful eternal future, which we can realize and subjectively and joyfully look forward to now a hope that is an incredible eternal future that comes from the Father. His love through the Son and in the Spirit, we have hope. So what do we say, church? Let's have hope. Amen. 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 Your hope came through, it was short. Sure.